Welcome to the second half of Chapter 9, Graphic Design and the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution first occurred in England between 1760 and 1840. This was a time of radical change for society. Before the perfection of the steam engine by James Watt around 1780, animal and human power were primary sources of energy. The Industrial Revolution changed all that. To begin, I want you to consider what were some of the effects upon society and culture as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Over the course of the 19th century, specialization of the factory system separated graphic communications into separate design and production components. The 19th century was an inventive period for new typeface design, new technologies, imaginative forms, and new functions for graphic design. We're going to be beginning our discussions with innovations in topography. The social and economic role of typographic communication cannot be ignored. The faster pace and mass communication needs of an increasingly urban and industrial society produced a quick expansion of printers, advertisers, and posters. Large-scale formats came into demand. The alphabet no longer served solely as phonetic symbols. The industrial age transformed these signs into abstract visual forms. This is an example of large sand-cast letters that were several inches high done by Thomas Cottero. Type grew steadily bolder by the decade. This led to the invention of fat faces by Robert Throne. Fat faces had a ratio of 1 to 2 to the capital height. These fonts were, not, these fonts were only the beginning as Throne's foundry began a lively competition with other type founders of the day. Vincent Figgins started his own operation and designed and cast a complete range of Romans and had begun to produce scholarly and foreign faces. In 1812, his printing specimens showed a full range of modern styles, including Egyptians, or slab serif, and three-dimensional fonts. I want you to be able to tell me what are the characteristics of slab serif, or Egyptian, letter forms. Around 1816 is when the very first specimen of sans serif type showed up. It was actually in the back of William Caslon IV's type specimen book. And early sans serif fonts were used mainly for subtitles and descriptive material under fat faces and Egyptians. So they were little noticed until around 1830 when several type founders introduced new sans serif styles. Each designer had a pet name of his own for these particular type styles. Some called them Doric, some called them Grotesques, Sans Syrups, and Gothics. Figgins named his specimen Sans Serif for the font's most memorable and obvious feature, being no feet, and the name stuck. German printers had a strong interest in Sans Serif typefaces, and by mid-century, Sans Serif typefaces were seeing increased use. This influx of new topography brings us to a unique category of typographic innovation, the wood type poster. An American inventor, Darius Wells, began to experiment with hand-carved wooden types, and he invented a device which allowed economic mass manufacturing of wood types for display printing. In 1828, he launched the wood type industry with his first specimen sheets. These wood types overcame many of the problems printers were facing in casting and printing large size fonts. Here's an example of a wood type poster. They were rather large and the fonts were extremely tall. So what was a problem facing printers in casting and printing large size fonts? This brings us to a revolution in printing. By 1800, Lord Stanhope's revised printing press could print up to 250 sheets per hour. By 1814, the steam-powered cylinder press invented by Friedrich Koenig, could print 1,100 sheets per hour, and this was just the beginning. By 1824, presses could print up to 2,400 sheets an hour. By the 1830s, printing began its huge expansion as all over Europe and America, book and newspaper printers began to retire their hand presses and replace them with steam-powered ones. What important factor was necessary to enable the higher production capability of these printing presses. Setting type by hand was a long, tedious, costly process. 
The first patent for a composing machine was registered in 1825. Otmar Mergenthaler perfected his linotype machine in 1886. Mergenthaler demonstrated his keyboard-operated machine in the office of the New York Tribune. It got its name from the editor exclaiming, Otmar, you've done it, a linotype. Get it? A linotype? Well, his breakthrough involved the use of smaller brass matrices with female impressions of the letter forms. Ninety typewriter-like keys controlled vertical cubes, tubes that were filled with these matrices. Each time the operator presses a key, it slid down a chute and was automatically lined up with the other characters in that line. Melted lead was poured onto the line matrices to cast a slug bearing the raised line of type. This machine could do the work of seven or eight compositors. Technological advances permitted machine-set topography to be printed on machine-manufactured paper with high steam-powered presses. This opened a new era of knowledge, education, and expanding literacy. The age of mass communications had arrived. The long reign of Victoria, who ruled the United Kingdom of Britain and Ireland in 1837, spanned most of the 19th century. God's in his heaven and all's right with the world was a popular motto of the day. The Victorian era was a time of strong moral and religious beliefs, proper social conventions, and optimism. The Victorians searched for design spirit to reflect the spirit of the day. Often, contradictory design approaches and philosophies mixed together, as seen in this image from the cover of the Pencil of Nature, where you have a heavy, dark, gothic print with a very ornate border. Sentimentality, nostalgia, and ideal of beauty were expressed through the printed images of children, maidens, puppies, and flowers. Traditional values of home, religion, and patriotism were symbolized with sweetness and piety. The main production medium was chromolithography, an invention and innovation of the Industrial Revolution that unleashed a flood of color printed images. This was a time period where a fondness for Gothic design was displayed. Architect A.W.N. Pugin was the first to articulate a philosophy. He defined design as a moral act that achieved the status of art through the designer's ideals and attitude. He believed that the integrity and character of a civilization were linked to its design. You can see the Gothic characteristics clearly in Pugin's design of the British Houses of Parliament. The Bible of Design for the Victorian era was called The Grammar of Ornament, and it was published in 1856 by Owen Jones. I'd like you to look into this book a little bit and tell me why this book has been called The Bible of Victorian Design. The development of lithography began around 1796 by a Bavarian inventor named Eloy Sunfelder. I want you to look into what is the lithographic process and then tell me what is color lithography.